Sorry, How I'm are you? Say. I'm good. Good to see you. Good to see you. Boy, you guys are having to do a lot virtually now. I think this is the wave of the future. Imagine that. You know, what's really funny is um, part of my job involves uh, WebRTC and video conferencing and everything. All right. And while humans like to close deals in person, I do think you're right that um, maybe this is going to force people to rethink the assumptions about all the travel that we have to do. Who knows? I think so. I think that might be one upside if, if there's any out of it. Right. So uh, nice to connect. Uh, we followed each other on social media for quite some wow. time. Yeah. And uh, congratulations on the successful launches and announcements of the past week and weeks. Thank you. Um, maybe for the folks watching, you could introduce yourself and your team at uh, Intel in the, in the data center group. Sounds great. So my name is Lynn Comp, and I'm the vice president of what we call VIDS. And that's a split role. I sit inside the network platforms group. So I run the network platforms group strategy, marketing, and market development. I also run a business unit that is very closely related to network dependencies called Visual Infrastructure Division. And that's really about how do you manage to create these amazing experiences that are visually based and then get them delivered, created in one place and consumed in another. So things like media processing and delivery or even media analytics or um, immersive media is another one or cloud gaming. So what's interesting is it's very network dependent and I'm also doing network strategy. So a lot of fun. Yeah, well, what an exciting time to be in our space. Uh, looking at your bio, you were an electrical engineer yes. back in the day. Back uh, in the day. <laughs> as was I. And uh, in fact, my first job uh, was at Intel. Oh, and wow. we, we were putting uh, telephony ports on cards in PCs, and that was a big deal. Oh, yeah. Uh, fast forward uh, for me uh, 25 years later, and um, it, it's a phenomenal to see the transformation of telephony and networking is that transformation what's driving this news and announcement and Intel's business? Yes. In fact, um, you know, I was, I won't tell you just how long my comms DNA goes back. <laughs> um, but when you look at the, on the wave of innovation that happened when you decoupled telephony so that you could do things like modems and PCM CIA cards. Yes, I do go back that far. Um, <laughs> But what's, what's really fascinating is a lot of the groundwork for why telephony and why the announcements today are so important really goes back to after the dot-com bubble and burst. And what had happened is a lot of the comms service providers had a very, very finely tuned set of resources because they knew exactly what did you need for their core application. And that application was voice. And then they managed to add text by taking advantage of some space in the packet frames. But the challenge that they then faced is, I have such finely tuned resources for voice, yet when you look at what's happening with the application economy, with the data economy, with things that are happening on smartphones that do more than voice and text, they found that they were stuck on some stranded resources that they had to depreciate over a long period of time and then didn't have the designed in flexibility for an application beyond voice. And so that whole thing is what has spurred us into even the ITU looking at 5G specifications as the merger of communications and compute. Wow, that's a, that's a great setup. And uh, we're at 5G now. My first 5G phone has arrived which I'll be a heavy user of, right. uh, hundreds of, of gigs, I imagine, given my uh, travel, et cetera. Oh, yeah. uh, so tell me, is, is it the usage of the edge devices like phones, but, but other kinds of endpoints yeah. that's really uh, requiring this rethinking of the network? That is absolutely part of it. Because if you think about the digital, you know, the analog to digital transformation, and then you've got 3G, which was much more about smartphone, text, and mobile uh, communications and connectivity. 4G and LTE was really about what do we do with this applications environment that we have coming at us? Um, nobody planned for as much data to go over the air uh, as happened as a result of the iPhone until after the iPhone happened. In fact, a comm service provider told me 
after some of the consequences became pretty clear that they needed offload to Wi-Fi and offload to fiber of some of this data. So 150 years of statistical models just went out the window. We have to oh, fun for us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So 5G, the thing that's really, I think, super smart about how the, it was approached is they said, yes, smartphones are important. Ultra high definition broadband is absolutely critical because if you look at Netflix in 2007, they went from shipping envelopes in the US to now having more subscribers outside the US than inside and streaming on every device. So you have to have that use case, there's no question. But what the 5G spec also did is it said, let's learn from uh, IoT trying to leverage 3G and 4G channels and what were some of the optimization points that we need to design in that we missed, that we didn't think about with those specs? And so they did massive machine to machine and then ultra reliable low latency. And so there are certain kinds of use cases in, that 5G could leverage or be leveraged in that you just couldn't quite get ethernet or Wi-Fi to meet. So a good example is industrial and robotics, where it's really a safety thing to need things to be wireless. It's also important with safety to have quality of service and ultra low latency. So they looked at it and said, what if we broke the rules of just a smartphone and said everything is going to need to communicate and everything is going to need to compute? What an exciting time. I was actually at a 5G event a couple of weeks ago uh, in Raleigh, and we were uh, sort of hands-on with some of the first small cell base stations that will be popping up on telephone light poles and other places around town uh, in your backyard uh, pretty soon. And um, it's really intriguing. This first generation of devices is, is upon us, but really we're going to see a, an explosion of edge devices and base station technology. And I imagine that's a market you're really keenly interested in uh, addressing. Yes. In fact, with the two announcements that we did, the Xeon second generation scalable and the Atom P5900, what it's just the next step in extension for Intel is going back to that dot com era. The service provider said, where's my Moore's law? <laughs> where's, right. where's my ability to have cloud like agile networks? And so the Xeon scalable second generation, you know, yes, you get 36 more percent more performance or 42 percent more performance per watt but you also get n SKUs, which are giving you significantly more nfv performance because we looked at what the scalable generation could do and said hey we could tune this a little bit more for nfv kind of the core network and then you can take the ia platform and that goodness and the reuse of those tools software scalability goes all the way out to the base station with the atom p5900 and what's really a good way to think of that is it's a portfolio because the P5900 doesn't have as much compute performance as Xeon Scalable, but it's almost two times more than the prior Atom generation. What it does have is like dynamic load balancing hardware acceleration for packet processing throughput, which is something you'd see more typically at the edge or in a base station. That's exciting. So network function virtualization, NFE has been a long time coming. We've been talking about it for a decade. Uh, has it arrived now with, with this announcement and the developers uh, taking advantage of it over the next, you know, 18 months? Yeah, in fact, one of the things that we are seeing, and it depends on what part of the network, how much virtualization is there, um, but we're about 50% of the core network is virtualized now and about 80% will be by 2024. And then we're just taking this RAN technology and giving you the basic support chassis to make that journey possible further and further out to the edge. Well, wow, that's super exciting. Uh, putting my EE hat on, which is quite old, but uh, it's a 10 me uh, nanometer device. Yes. Uh, which is kind of shocking that you've managed such integration. Yeah. Uh, I, I imagine customers are going to see price performance, right? I mean, that's the driver for this kind of deep sub-micron integration. Yes. Uh, where do you go from here? <laughs> you kind of at the bleeding edge here on technology and you're leveraging this into a new market. Is it onwards and upwards? I think it's always onwards and upwards. And, you know, the way to look at it is there's, there's like, as you know, as a double E, there's the best power efficiency is going to involve hardware, but most flexibility generationally is going to involve software. 
And what we want to do with things like second generation Xeon scalable and Atom P5900 in evolving those forward is really understand from customers what is the right anchor point for design at the service problem you're solving. Because in some cases, just to give you the media example, if you're Netflix, you really need CPU computational power because your problem for quality over low bandwidth and bit rate is something that's going to require the computational complexity of the CPU and you're doing it offline. But if you're trying to do something that's live, real time, transcode, gamer type applications, well, you're going to be really worried about speed as opposed, and bandwidth is not as much of a problem. So very similar to that with the comms network, you're going to end up with some services that are going to be best leveraged on top of a Xeon environment because you can get virtualization density, you get the multi-tenancy, you get the AI acceleration that you get inside of the Xeon. Um, but there's going to be some other problems, uh, some other challenges, small cell, for example, where you're probably going to want to go further into adding hardware hooks. And it's always this balance of how do I get the power low without costing the customer too much flexibility in their software. Fantastic. Well, you're already partnering with who's who of the telecom right. equipment world, and I'm sure you, you, you have, will have a massive success there. What about on the edge where you have hundreds of devices and vendors and OEMs with all kinds of crazy and innovative new products and solutions? I saw a, a Razer cloud gaming uh, 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 router you, you, know, right. you can take for eSports. You could take around and, and sort of do uh, an eSports uh, event on the fly. Mm -hmm. Are those sort of target markets of uh, customers Absolutely. and partners that you're going after as well as a traditional core networks? Absolutely. Because one of the things is if you can get the network to be agile and flexible and programmable and the network slicing becomes very, very easy to be automated and orchestrated, then you have the ability to have the exact same channel iterating between whether it's addressing cloud gaming where you've got to have ultra reliable latency because if one gamer gets better latency than another gamer guess who loses the one with the bad latency right <laughs> and so there's a need for consistency there but you could actually then get that same channel when the game's over with release that resource and then maybe you have somebody that wants to watch hg movies in 4k and that's going to be a completely different network profile. And so the network can match the flexibility of the application need on top. And those applications will be tuned for latency, bandwidth savings, et cetera. Oh, well, that's super exciting. Well, for me, it's the best time to be in this industry, in this space as a professional and observer. So congratulations on all the success and hope to see you actually live at an event uh, at some point in the, uh, the short or medium term. So thanks very much for chatting and Thank look forward so to more Kevin. news and insights. Great. Thank you. Thanks. All right.